Good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jonathan Adler. I'm a professor here at the law school and director of the Center for Business Law and Regulation. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual uh, Dean Lindsay Cowan Business Law Lecture uh, that is sponsored by the Center for Business Law and Regulation here at the law school. Uh, the center was founded in 2003 uh, with the aims of helping to prepare future leaders to understand business issues facing entrepreneurs, business entities, and, and other clients, to sponsor legal, empirical, and interdisciplinary research on the role and impact of government in the regulation of business, and to foster public debate on issues relating to the role of government in the regulation of businesses. And our programs range from specialized curricular offerings, speaker series such as this, fellowships, academic workshops and conferences uh, along those lines. I should note that uh, next week uh, on Friday, April 17th, the center is sponsoring a day-long program. Uh, it's the George Leet Business Law Symposium on the topic, Institutional Investors in Corporate Governance, Heroes or Villains. That will be here in this room. Uh, it's a day-long program. Uh, four and a half hours of CLE credit will be available, and there's uh, information uh, both outside and, and on our website. Uh, today, uh, it's, it's really a, a pleasure and honor uh, uh, to be hosting the, the fifth annual uh, Dean Lindsay Cowan Business Law Lecture. Uh, this lecture series was established with a gift from the Ferry Family Foundation to honor the legacy of, of Dean Lindsay Cowan, uh, one of the former deans of this law school. Uh, and we are certainly very grateful to the generosity of the Ferry Family Foundation that uh, has made this series possible. In prior years, we've hosted uh, federal appellate court judges, uh, noted academics, uh, and a Nobel laureate economist. Uh, and uh, this year, I think continuing uh, a string of, of prominent and important speakers, it's really a, a, an honor and pleasure to uh, be able to welcome Paul Clement to the law school uh, to deliver this year's lecture. Uh, Paul Clement is currently a partner and head of the National Appellate Practice in the Washington, D.C. office of King and Spaulding, uh, but was most recently the 43rd Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, before that, he had been both uh, the Principal Deputy uh, Solicitor General in that office and Acting Solicitor General. Uh, in a little over seven years in that office, he argued what I think is an astounding number of 49 cases before the United States Supreme Court, uh, cases ranging from MGM versus Grokster to Rumsfeld versus Padilla to McConnell versus Federal Elect Elections Commission, uh, Rapanos versus United States, United States versus Booker. Uh, it's hard to think of a, an issue before the U.S. Supreme Court uh, that he hasn't argued. Um, and I think has generally been recognized as, as uh, quite successful uh, Solicitor General uh, and someone who set a model of, of, of how individuals should hold that office. Uh, in addition, he uh, was a clerk for Lawrence Silverman on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, a clerk for uh, Justice Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and also been chief counsel to the Senate Subcommittee on the Constitution of the Senate, Senate Judiciary Committee and an adjunct, adjunct professor at Georgetown University, uh, School, uh, Georgetown University Law Center, um, and it's my distinct pleasure to, to welcome uh, Paul today to deliver a lecture on the Roberts Court as a business court. And since none of you are here to, uh, to hear me speak, I will, without any further ado, turn it over to Paul. Uh, so the podium is yours. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, and I'm very happy to, uh, to be with you here today. And what I thought I would... Uh, try to accomplish in the time that we have together is to talk a little bit about the Roberts Court as a business court. And the reason that uh, this particular topic occurred to me as something uh, worth talking about is I think that particularly um, at the end of last term and, uh, and even maybe more dramatically uh, the end of the first full term of the Roberts Court together, there was really an emerging consensus that the Roberts Court was a particularly favorable court uh, for business interests. Uh, and this was put, you know, colorfully by some critics of the, of the Roberts Court, put a little more soberly by those simply analyzing the court. But any, uh, any way you looked at it, there was this perception that the Roberts Court was a very, very favorable forum for the interests of corporate corporations generally and corporate defendants in particular. And some of you may have seen in the, uh, the reading material and the CLE material this article by Jeffrey Rosen, Professor Jeffrey Rosen, in the, uh, in, in the New York Times Magazine, the Sunday Magazine, uh, called Supreme Court Inc. That's I-N-C period, not I-N-K. Uh, the obvious idea behind this article is Supreme Court Incorporated. Here's a, here's a court that is uniquely favorable towards business interests. Now, as I say, some, some, some of the, the, the people who are a little more critical of the Roberts Court generally put this fairly uh, colorfully. Uh, so the New York Times editorial page uh, 
accused the Roberts Court of having, quote, a knee-jerk inclination to rule for corporations over workers and consumers. Uh, professor, and I guess now Dean, Erwin Chemerinsky wrote, of, in the specific context of preemption, wrote, quote, of the court's willingness to find preemption and help businesses at the expense of injured people. And as I also said, you know, these are, those comments come from, from an organization or an editorial board and a, and a professor who are probably fairly described as being generally critical of the Roberts Court. But even people who have no particular bones with the Roberts Court were making similar observations. And the one that always struck me, uh, in part because um, I respect Maureen Mahoney a great deal as a very uh, gifted advocate and student of the court, is that at the end of the first uh, Roberts Court, the first full term together, October term 2006, Maureen Mahoney said at a kind of Supreme Court summary and roundup that she used to think that the Rehnquist Court was a good court for business until she saw the Roberts Court. Uh, and then she really knew what a, what a pro-business court was effectively. Now, so with, with so many observations, so many observers of the court making this observation, I thought it was really kind of worth trying to explore uh, the extent to which the Roberts Court really is a business court. And I think those that point to the Roberts Court as being a good court for business, there are probably at least two strands to the narrative uh, that the Roberts Court is a great court for business. One strand of the narrative is that in an era in which the court's overall docket is shrinking, the Roberts Court was taking, a, in, in, if anything, an increasing number of business cases, or certainly the same number of business cases, such that business cases were becoming an increasingly large portion of the court's docket. The second strand of the narrative, and perhaps the more important strand, I think, for those making uh, these observations, was that, and once the court took the business cases, the business interests were doing very well. Now, in some cases, it's a little harder to make that conclusion. You have, you know, in a lot of, say, patent and antitrust cases, you have business entities on both sides of the case. But I think it's fair to say that this, this strain of the narrative emphasized the fact that corporate defendants in particular were doing quite well in the Supreme Court of the United States uh, with Chief Justice Roberts at the helm. Now, in looking at these two strands of the narrative, I, I would say that my own view is that the first strand of the narrative uh, holds up pretty well. I think it is in fact true that the Supreme Court is taking more business cases. I don't think it's by orders of magnitude more, but I do think that there has been a seemingly significant uptick in the number of business court cases that the, that the court is taking. Now, in making this observation, I have to start with the caveat that it's a little bit difficult to you know, really identify precisely what's a business case. Uh, some of them, I think, are pretty straightforward. If you have a, a preemption case, if you have an antitrust case, those are pretty classically business cases. There are other cases that I think it's the, the, that sort of defy categorization or easy categorization. As a, as a for instance, I think one uh, measure of the number of business cases on the court's docket that a number of people have used, and I plan to use in a minute, uh, is the number of cases on the court's docket where the Chamber of Commerce files an amicus brief. Um, since the you know, Chamber of Commerce is generally not out on a frolic and a detour to file, file amicus briefs in cases of no interest to the corporate community, that's a pretty good indicator. On the other hand, one substantive doctrinal area where the Chamber routinely files amicus briefs is the campaign finance area. And I certainly wouldn't think at first blush that campaign finance regulation is an obvious area of where, where you think of as being a business case. So I think there is this issue of categorization. But uh, let me forge on by saying that if you look at that particular metric, um, I do think that the numbers bear out that, the, that they're, the business cases are an increasing part of the court's docket. If you look at the last three years, for example, that the Rehnquist Court was together, the Chamber filed a fairly healthy but, uh, number of briefs. On average, they filed 17 briefs a term. Um, in the first three years of the Roberts Court, the number is up to 20 an average of 20 uh, a briefs a, a, a term. Now, it's a three-brief difference. It might not overwhelm you, but if you also take into account that the Roberts Court in these first three years was also hearing about 10 less cases total, then I think these numbers become a little bit more significant. Likewise, the Chamber has done their own estimate um, uh, that looks to factors other than just whether they filed an amicus brief, and the numbers that they came up with is that during the entire time of the Rehnquist Court when Justice Breyer was a member, so essentially the last 11 or so years of the, of the Rehnquist Court, they the, the, the business cases made up approximately 
of the court's docket, and now under the Roberts Court, the business cases make up 43 percent of the court's docket. And again, this isn't a doubling of the business docket. It's not something uh, that, that uh, some of you may find inherently dramatic. On the other hand, you know, those of us who follow the Supreme Court very closely, I think are a little like uh, criminologists in the 1980s. I mean, you know, the slightest uh, difference in the way that the Supreme Court does business uh, is something that, that, that we focus on quite a bit. And I think a, a 5 percent uptick in the number of business cases on the court's docket is something, I think, that, that bears out this first part of the narrative. So, so far, so good. But I think the more interesting claim about the Roberts Court as being a business court is that this is a court where the business uh, interests and the corporate defendants in particular uh, do uh, very well before the court. And, um, you know, it's, it's, with, it's with a just a hint of pride that I, that I, that I note that I was on record, um, you know, as early as the end of last term and even before then, as suggesting that this characterization of the Roberts Court was at a minimum vastly oversimplified. To simply say that the Roberts Court is a pro-business court seemed to me to be a gross uh, overgeneralization. And I think a couple of very recent and very high-profile preemption cases, which I'll talk about in a minute, in which the Supreme Court found for the plaintiffs and against the interests of the corporate defendants, uh, those two recent preemption cases, I think, are starting to cause uh, a little bit of a reexamination of this easy assumption that the Roberts Court is a tremendously pro-business court. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that, uh, and I can, I, you know, I can show you the sites if you, need, if you need them, that I was a little bit ahead of the curve on this one because I do think these most recent cases are hardly the product of a pro-business court. But now in saying that, you know, it, calling the Roberts Court just a business court or a pro-business court is oversimplified, I don't mean to suggest that there's nothing meaningful that one can say about the Roberts Court uh, a, as a business court or how the Roberts Court approaches business cases. To the contrary, it seems to me that the critical thing to appreciate here is that, you know, the, the real problem with calling the Roberts Court a business court is that the business cases are just too broad a target. They're too an amorphous mix of cases. And I think if, you, if we drill down perhaps one level of specificity further down, I think you can start to make some meaningful comments about how the Roberts Court is inclined to approach certain kinds of cases. Now, I've picked four types of cases to talk about uh, this, this afternoon. You could certainly uh, pick, uh, pick, pick other cases. And as evidence of that, Professor Adler, in his own work, is, uh, has taken a look at the environmental cases uh, with a particular uh, eye to this, this very question. I'll leave those to him. Um, I'm going to focus instead on four sets of cases, the preemption cases, the employment cases, uh, the antitrust cases, and dare I say it in, uh, in, in mixed company, the patent cases. So I'm going to talk about those four sets of cases and see if, we can, if, if I can at least, you know, sort of share at least some thoughts about what can be meaningfully said about the Roberts Court. Well, let me start with the preemption cases, and let me start particularly with the two preemption cases that the Supreme Court has decided so far this term. The first of those is the Altria case. Um, and this is a case that arises in the, in the context of cigarettes and cigarette labeling. This was the very first case the Supreme Court heard this term on the first Monday in October. And it's a case that, along with the Wyeth case involving preemption in the pharmaceutical context, I think get, grabbed the attention of a lot of people who watched the court. Now, the basic holding of the court in the Altria case was that the court ruled five to four in favor of the plaintiff and said that state law fraud claims based on advertising of cigarettes as light or low tar, uh, were not preempted by federal law, and those state tort claims could go forward. And the basic claim here is the idea that when cigarette manufacturers advertise cigarettes as light or low tar, it was inherently misleading because the actual dynamics of smoking a cigarette is if you have less tar or less nicotine in the cigarette, all you're going to do is draw more heavily on the, on the cigarette, and so you're going to end up in the same place. That's the nature of the claim. The argument was made by the tobacco companies, well, wait a second. You know, this testing method for determining the tar in cigarettes is something that had the FTC's blessing. To be sure, those tests were done with a mechanical device that had a, you know, very uniform method of dragging on the cigarettes. People don't smoke that way. But the FTC was all over this, the Federal Trade Commission, so this is preempted. The Supreme Court said, no, it was not preempted. And uh, for those that follow this particular area of the law, there was a certain sense that, that all that was old was new again. 
Uh, what I mean by that is that the Supreme Court had reached a very similar holding uh, in 1992, 16 years before, in a case called Chipolone. And with all the various twists and turns in the court's preemption doctrine since that case 16 years ago, it is somewhat remarkable that the court basically ended up in the exact same place, only this time there was a majority opinion for five justices. I can report that the majority opinion written by Justice Stevens looks an awful lot like the plurality opinion written 16 years earlier by Justice Stevens. Um, the, the critical distinction that the court draws is between claims uh, that, that are really based on uh, this, the advertising of the cigarettes themselves and those claims that are based on an underlying state duty of fraud or, 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 or misrepresentation that happen to uh, implicate the area of smoking and health. If that sounds less than clear, then you're well suited to be on the federal bench. Because in the 16 years when, since the Cipollone plurality decision was, you know, had to be applied by the lower courts, the lower courts were all over the map in trying to apply this somewhat Delphic pronouncement, which is why the issue actually worked its way back up to the Supreme Court. And even the majority opinion in this case, echoing a line from the earlier plurality opinion, had to concede that its test lacked, quote, theoretical elegance. Uh, but elegant or not, it's the test for cigarette preemption going forward. Now, Wyeth was also this preemption case in the pharmaceutical context, and I think it's fair to say that this was one of the closest watched cases of this Supreme Court term. Now, in fairness, I think that says a lot both about this case but also about the Supreme Court's term. Uh, this is not a term where there's a tremendous number of huge blockbuster cases, and so this preemption case perhaps got more focus than it otherwise would. Uh, Part of the reason this case was considered very interesting, I think, is that last year uh, the Supreme Court decided a very important uh, case in the closely allied area of uh, medical devices. And in the medical device context, the court found that federal law preempted state tort claims of certain kinds of medical devices. And the court decided that by an 8-1 margin, which I think surprised a lot of people that the Supreme Court uh, ruled that lopsidedly in favor of preemption. So with that regal decision about medical device preemption as the backdrop, a lot of people looked to the Wyeth case as being maybe this is the, the, the year that the court will extend preemption from the medical device context to the pharmaceutical context. And that would be quite, in a sense, small r revolution in the sense that the federal regulation of pharmaceuticals has been around since the 1930s, and state tort law in this context has been around in one form or another almost since the 1930s. So it would be quite um, unusual to find out at this late in the game that all those state tort claims were preempted. And I think in many respects that historical kind of burden of the argument that there was preemption in this context is ultimately what helped persuade the Supreme Court to find that there was not preemption in this context. So a year after deciding eight to one in favor of preemption in the medical device context, the court decides six to three in favor of uh, the state law going forward and against preemption in the context of pharmaceuticals. One important thing uh, to, to focus on in the Wyeth case, and in some respects I think the most enduringly significant part of the case, may well be the concurrence of Justice Thomas. Because Justice Thomas writes a concurrence where he basically suggests that he is not uh, interested in applying what's called implied preemption in this particular case, and more generally, uh, he doesn't think there's much to be said for implied preemption. And a lot of the Supreme Court's um, important cases in the preemption area do not apply just an express provision in the statute, so-called express preemption, but they find an implied preemption from the scope of the statute and the interference that state tort law would cause to the federal regime. Justice Thomas has basically said he's not going to be engaged in those kind of cases, so it does make the burden on those arguing for preemption going forward to essentially try to get five votes out of eight as opposed to five votes out of nine. So that is one aspect of it that's quite significant. Now, more broadly, what can we say about the Roberts Court uh, in the area of preemption? Uh, what I guess I would suggest is that in this particular area, one should fight the tendency to read too much into the most recent uh, Supreme Court decisions on preemption. I mean, if you go back a few years, there's, you know, people sort of look at the last court's last word on preemption and sort of see some sort of sea change in analysis that's going to be broadly applicable to all sorts of different federal regulatory regimes and all sorts of different state tort laws. But if you look at the Supreme Court's recent cases, I mean, there's just too many sea changes to believe that's what's going on. 
I mean, the court issued a very pro-preemption ruling in the Geyer case back in about uh, 1996 or so. That was followed by a very anti-preemption case called Bates a few years later. That was followed by the very pro-preemption decision in Regal that I mentioned in the medical device context. And then that's followed by Altria and Wyeth cutting the other way. And I think the message here is ultimately that there is no sort of general law of preemption. I mean, the court, you know, talks in some cases about applying a presumption against preemption, so it's disinclined to have it. But if you look at the cases over the last 16 years, you find that the cases that find no preemption talk a lot about the presumption against preemption. The cases that find preemption don't even mention it. And I think the real lesson here is not that, that the court is being lawless in this area, but that what really matters is the specifics of the particular regulatory regime. I think if you look at it in the context of Wyeth, what ultimately doomed the argument for preemption here was two things. One, the history of not having federal preemption in this particular context. But the second thing was the fact that it seemed like the regulatory agency, the FDA, had come very late in the game to the position that there was preemption of state tort law. And I think there was also a sense on the Supreme Court that, you know, it wasn't like the FDA was, was, was making no mistakes in its regulation of drugs. And so I think that's what really made a difference in that context. Compare that to the very closely allied context of medical devices. And in that context, the regulatory regime is much more recent. The FDA had a uniform position that the federal medical device amendments preempted state tort law from the very beginning. Those amendments were only added in, 19, in the 1970s. And so you have a very different context between the two cases. And I think that, more than anything else, explains the changes in results. The last point to make about preemption before moving forward is rather than look to the Supreme Court for some unifying theory of preemption, in some respects, the better place to look about preemption law in the next couple of years may be the Congress. Because the one thing that all nine members of the Supreme Court agree on is that if Congress is sufficiently clear, it can preempt state tort law. They also, all nine of them agree, that if Congress is sufficiently clear, it can put in a savings clause and make crystal clear that state tort law and the federal regulatory regime can coexist. And so particularly in the context of a new Congress that seems much less inclined to preempt state tort law and much more inclined to let both federal regulation and state tort law coexist, it may be that where most of the action is on preemption going forward is actually in the Congress. And in that context, you know, I think the corporate community in arguing for preemption almost has to be worried about what, you know, what it hopes for. If, if the Wyeth case had come out differently and was a huge victory for the pharmaceutical manufacturers, I think we would almost certainly see the Wyeth Repeal Act already pending in Congress at this point. And so I think that is an important thing to keep in mind. Well, let me shift to the employment context, the second context I want to talk about. And here let me make the claim that I'm sure you know, some could dispute, but I think there's, there's a lot to this claim, which is the Roberts Court has actually been, if you look at especially their more recent decisions, been surprisingly receptive to the, to, to the claims of employees. And in a series of cases, certainly there are exceptions to this rule, but in a series of cases has sided in favor of employees and, get, and against employers in the context of claims brought under the various federal anti-discrimination statutes, be it Title VII, be it the ADA, the AGE Act, or the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's certainly not universally true. And one very clear example of a case where the Roberts Court ruled in favor of the employers and against the employees was the Ledbetter case, a case about the statute of limitation for uh, claims of, of, uh, under Title VII for differential pay for female workers based on, ver uh, on decisions that have been made about promotion or pay in, in, the, in the fairly distant past that were carried over into current paychecks. And the court in, in a 5-4 in decision said, you know, there's, there's a relatively limited statute of limitations for those claims. So if you, if, you were, if you suffered some adverse pay decision way back in the day, you should have brought a claim about it back then. You can't now challenge the sort of the, the, the current implications of that decision in the past. That was a 5-4 decision in the Ledbetter case. The, the, the Congress reacted to that. Uh, very, you know, quickly, but in the last Congress, uh, the, the, the act did not become law. I believe it was vetoed in the end by the president. But with the new Congress, they passed the statute. I think it was the first uh, piece of legislation on President Obama's desk. So there's one counterexample. But I think if you look at 
the employment cases more broadly, uh, that, that, that this is a case where I think the Roberts Court would surprise some people. One area where I've argued a couple of cases and have paid a fair amount of attention to is the context of claims of retaliation. And if you look at the last four cases, that the, or the only four cases, involving retaliation claims brought before the Roberts Court, in every one of those four cases, the employee has prevailed. And uh, one, one case from this term exemplifies that. It's the Crawford case. It's actually a case out of the Sixth Circuit. So let me mention it just briefly. The Crawford case addresses the scope of the retaliation coverage under one of the most important anti-discrimination statutes, Title VII. And specifically, the question before the court in the Crawford case was whether the Title VII's anti-retaliation prohibition prohibited retaliation when somebody testified in an internal employee, employer-driven internal investigation. Now, the Sixth Circuit, in a decision that I think it's, it's, it's only fair to say it was at least counterintuitive, uh, held that an employee was not protected in that situation. Now, there were two subclauses of the relevant provision of the anti-retaliation provision, the so-called opposition clause and the so-called participation clause. And what the Sixth Circuit effectively held is that these claims in the employer's own internal investigation process by a witness fall between the cracks. If, if, the, if, if the person testifying in the internal proceeding was actually the victim herself or himself, that's one thing. They, then they come within the opposition clause. And if somebody's a witness in a formal proceeding before the EEOC, that falls within the participation clause. But if you're just a witness in the internal process, that fell between the cracks. Well, that was a case where the Supreme Court made rather short work uh, of the case. The Supreme Court essentially unanimously overruled the Sixth Circuit's decision. Only two justices concurred separately, and they did not uh, take an issue with the result in this particular case. They simply reserved a little bit about what the broader implications of it, uh, the decision might be. So essentially the court 9 nothing overrules uh, the, ninth, the, the Sixth Circuit and in, in this case, and that is part of this broad uh, pattern of very favorable decisions for the employee in the context of retaliation claims. And of course these claims are quite, quite significant as a practical matter. Um, I think that uh, you know, one of the things that I had the opportunity to do as Solicitor General was to review all of the uh, appeal recommendations any time there was an adverse decision in the federal government in order to take it up to the Court of Appeals, the Solicitor General had to review and approve that appeal. One of the areas that there was a substantial volume of cases was the employment case because most of these anti-discrimination statutes apply to the federal government as employer and the federal government happens to be the nation's largest employer. So numbers being what they are, that means there's a fair number of uh, anti-discrimination claims and retaliation claims brought against the federal government as employer. And what I saw over and over again was the following pattern. Initial allegation is that there was discrimination on the basis of some forbidden characteristic, and then once there was a complaint, there was also retaliation. So that's the allegations in the complaint. The jury comes back and says, oh, there was no discrimination in the first instance, but you bet there was retaliation, so we're going to give substantial damages against the employer, not because of the discrimination claim, but because of the retaliation claim. So the, the extent to which these statutes cover retaliation as well as uh, the underlying discrimination is an important issue, both practically and jurisprudentially. Now, what might explain uh, this, this, this at least modest pro-employee tendency in a court that most people, I think, would think of as being a relatively uh, conservative and pro-business court? Well, I think that there are a, a couple of potential explanations. Um, in many respects, though, I think that in an, in an interesting way, the Ledbetter case provides a clue. Because all of these cases, unlike some of the other cases where uh, there may be more, more than this going on, at the end of the day, all of these cases are statutory interpretation cases. And this is a textualist court, and, and this is a court that I think you know, takes the statute very seriously. Well, the Congress, you know, over the last couple of decades, has not been shy about providing protections for employees in the context of these anti-discrimination statutes. And the Ledbetter case, I think, is a good example of that. I mean, when, they, when, the, when, the, when, this, when the Congress perceives that the Supreme Court is interpret, has interpreted an anti-discrimination statute to be more miserly in its protections than the Congress intended, they have not been shy about restoring the law. I mean, you had the Civil Rights Restoration Act uh, back in 1991. You have the Ledbetter Act. 
So I think what, what explains this more than anything else is the fact that many of the statutes that the court is interpreting are relatively pro-employee st statutes. And so I think that goes a long way to, uh, to explaining it. A second factor, um, and one that you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, is the fact that uh, the Solicitor General's office has also, I think, had a tendency to, uh, to reinforce this tendency. Um, even though the, the, you know, the Bush administration uh, is obviously a Republican administration and the stereotype might be that on the margin they would favor the employee, employer more than the employee, in a number of the cases in which the, the court has fit, ruled in favor of the employee, the Solicitor General's office also weighed in in favor of the employee, and again, largely on the basis of the SG represents, among other people, the Civil Rights Division, the EEOC, that are responsible for enforcing these statutes. And if you look at these statutes and you look at the text, they do provide the relevant protection. Um, I, I, one statistic that, that I read recently that I can't help but, uh, but note because um, it, 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 it puts a smile on my face is that uh, in a paper for a conference out at Santa Clara that Professor Adler was at, uh, Sri Srinivasan and uh, Bradley Jundef put together a paper that tried to look at the various influences of the Roberts Court in uh, business cases. And they found that if you isolated those cases where the Solicitor General's office filed a brief on the opposite side of the Chamber of Commerce. So they both file amicus briefs, but they're on different sides. In those cases, and you can uh, essentially infer that in those cases, the Solicitor General's office is filing a brief that's adverse to the corporate interest. In a universe of 14 cases in the Roberts Court where that happened, uh, the Roberts Court went with the Solicitor General's office in 13 out of the 14 cases. So I can't help but pass that, that statistic along. Um, and I think what that shows, though, is that there were a number of cases, a significant number of cases, where despite what you might think about either the Bush administration or the Roberts Court, that just as a matter of statutory construction, the statutes favored the interest of the employees in those cases, and the Roberts Court followed suit. Now, everything has a qualification, and one of the Supreme Court's most recent decisions was a case called uh, Pyatt against 14 Park Plaza, a case about arbitration where the court sided with, in a 5-4 decision, sided with the employer, found that these anti-discrimination claims were not preempted, uh, rather, the, 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 the anti-discrimination claims were not exempt from arbitration, so they had to be uh, subject to the arbitration award. That was a case where the Roberts Court decided 5-4 against the employee, against the SG's office, and in favor of the Chamber of Commerce position. So I guess we're 13 out of 15 now, to be fair. I think what that shows is, is more than anything, though, is that this is an incredibly pro-arbitration court, which is yet another strand of the Roberts Court as a business court, but not one I plan to talk about. Let me talk about two other areas before I, I leave some time for questions. The, the, the next area to talk about is, uh, is the patent area. And as I said, I, I do this with some hesitation in mixed company. Patent cases are generally left for the discussion of patent lawyers. Uh, but I, I think it's almost necessary to mention the patent docket because especially during the first two terms of the Roberts Court, this was an incredibly significant part of their business docket. They heard three patent cases each year during their first two terms uh, together as the Roberts Court. What that translates to in sort of normal years is literally over a decade's worth of patent cases. Supreme Court historically has taken a patent case about every other year, at least in recent years since it created the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which has exclusive jurisdiction over patent cases. And then all of a sudden, after sort of taking a case every other year and essentially leaving these cases to the Federal Circuit, the Supreme Court and the Roberts Court takes six cases uh, in a very short uh, matter of time. These cases were uh, very important cases, some of them. The KSR case, for example, dealt with the question of what qualifies for an invention as being obvious. Um, this, the, the, the importance of that question, I guess, to patent lawyers is obvious because every single patent has to show that the patented subject matter is not obvious. And so the, the, the Supreme Court's decisions in these cases literally affects every extant patent. Um, and, and, and now, when you look at these six cases, um, some very kind of interesting uh, patterns emerge. Um, one very interesting pattern, and this is why I think you can say something meaningful about sub-areas of the court's docket, is that the, the Federal Circuit, which is a circuit that has, as I say, exclusive jurisdiction over the patent cases and was created 25 years ago to essentially take the burden off certainly the, the regional courts of appeals and to a certain extent the Supreme Court and really deal with the specialized subject area of patent law this expert specialized patent court doesn't do very well 
when the Supreme Court reviews a patent case. If you look at the, the, there was one patent case that really involved sort of a different jurisdictional issue, but if you look at the five of the six cases that were really more pure patent cases that go back from, from I guess, starting with the eBay case and going to the Quanta case, which was a more recent case, in these five cases, the court voted to reverse the Federal Circuit decision in all five of the cases, and the total vote tally was 43 to 2. So in five patent cases, there were exactly two votes to side with the expert patent case, court. So that is, that is something I think that is, that, is, that is particularly significant. Now, let me ask two why questions here. First off, why is there this renewed interest in patent law? And I think that maybe there's a couple of strands here. One is I think that the Roberts Court has recognized, and this is perhaps a recognition that might be helped by the fact that the new Chief Justice is somebody who was a veteran of arguing cases in the Federal Circuit and understood the importance of the issues in the Federal Circuit, I think the Roberts Court has recognized that intellectual property is just too important to our economy right now to have the Supreme Court essentially take a powder on the issue. I mean, you know, it's, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but in some respects, you know, the, you know, what really drives the American economy at this point is not old, the old-fashioned economy, but it's intellectual property. And so the laws for that, the protections for that, I think are essentially too important in the court's view to leave just to the lower courts. But the second uh, observation here that's inescapable is this notion, and I don't know if this is borne out by the Chief Justice having argued cases in the Federal Circuit or not, but a certain s sense that having looked at a few of these patent cases, the court is not overwhelmed with the job that they see in the Federal Circuit uh, cases, case law. Now, that begs the second why question. Why having created this specialized appellate court for patent law, why, when the court takes these cases, does it seem to think that the Federal Circuit is not doing a very good job? And here I think that there are at least two explanations that go a long way for, for, to explaining this. One is I think there is something of a natural evolution here because to give the Federal Circuit its due, if you're a court that's essentially been given a specialized jurisdiction and then been more or less left alone for 25 years, it seems only to make sense that you are going to develop specialized rules about how to process patent appeals that might not have a direct analog in Supreme Court precedent. And so you have this phenomenon, which I think is borne out in some of these cases, where you know, this, the Federal Circuit may develop a special test for obviousness in order to streamline these many claims. Or in the eBay case, for example, you know, I think most lawyers are familiar with the familiar four-factor test for preliminary injunctions. Well, in the patent context, the Federal Circuit came up with its own rule. Now, it, you know, where they kind of modified the familiar four-factor test. Well, you can understand why there'd be an impulse to do that if you're dealing with all these patent appeals and you're trying to deal with special rules and special claims processing rules. Of course, then it's not surprising, and this is the, the, the second point, and it's really the corollary of the first, it's not surprising that a generalist federal court, when they look into these areas, is not that impressed by the deviation from the standard way of doing these, of handling these cases. I mean, the, the four-factor test is familiar to the Supreme Court because it applies everywhere. And when they take a look at a case like the eBay case and see that the Federal Circuit is not applying the familiar four-factor test but doing something different, I think they had a strong impulse in that case to say, wait a second, this is good enough for every other area of the law. It's good enough for patent law. So here, too, I think, just as in some of these other areas, if you focus on a more specific topic than just the business law cases, I think there is something meaningful to be said. And what's meaningful to be said is the Roberts Court seems to be increasingly interested in patent cases. And if the court does take a case, I wouldn't bet all your money on the federal circuit being affirmed. Lastly, let me look at the antitrust uh, area of the court's docket uh, as, as, as a final area to, to spend some time at. Uh, here, too, I think what is noteworthy is that the Roberts Court, especially in its first couple of years together, showed an intense interest in the antitrust docket. There were seven antitrust cases uh, on the court's docket in the first two terms of the Roberts Court. And there's only been one case since then, which is the pending link line case. But still, those seven cases in two terms is quite remarkable. I mentioned the patent area. The court was taking about a, a patent case every other year. In the antitrust area, it was more like an antitrust case every term. But to take seven cases in two terms, that was really remarkable. Now, it's per perhaps in the antitrust area, though, I think, that the clearest trends emerge. And you can maybe say the most definitive things about the Roberts Court, if not as a, as a business court, as an antitrust court. Because here you have seven cases. Well, what unites all seven of these cases 
The court, in these cases, the court ruled seven for seven in favor of the antitrust defendant. And in virtually all of these cases, the court initially took the case on a petition of the antitrust defendant and where the antitrust defendant was complaining that the Court of Appeals decision was unfavorable to the, to the antitrust defendant and made it too easy, essentially, for the antitrust plaintiff to prove uh, his or her case. So in, in these cases, the court goes seven to seven in favor of the corporate defendants. And it's also true that the court ruled uh, in these cases, lopsidedly in favor of the corporate defendants. So this is not necessarily some unique product of a conservative 5-4 split or something. In most of these antitrust cases, the court was ruling lopsidedly in favor of the antitrust defendant. So let's put aside to one second the one case that was decided 5-4, to four, the Legion case about uh, vertical resale price maintenance, and let's look at the other six cases. So six cases, antitrust cases, in the, in the first two years of the Roberts Court, in those six cases, there were a total of five votes for the antitrust plaintiff. So the average one of these decisions essentially is being decided eight to one uh, against the antitrust plaintiff and in favor of the antitrust defendant. Now, the exception, as I, as I mentioned, is this Legion case, but it really is an exception because I think the Legion case uh, ends up being a case more about stare decisis uh, than really about antitrust law. The question in the Legion case was whether, a, uh, whether to subject a vertical resale price maintenance agreement to the rule of reason or the per se rule. Uh, back in 1911, in a case called Dr. Miles, uh, the Supreme Court said these kind of vertical agreements were subject to per se invalidation. But in a whole host of series of cases decided more recently, the Supreme Court has basically backed away from the per se treatment of vertical agreements and basically said, look, you got a, hor a horizontal Price, price agreement, you have a horizontal geographical uh, agreement, um, that's subject to per se rule. But these vertical agreements within a distribution chain and the like, those are subject to rational, uh, the rule of reason in, in all sorts of other contexts. And this seemed like the last context where the, where the courts were still instructed to apply the per se rule. So Dr. Miles comes around in 1911. I think it's fair to say it was subject to criticism starting in about 1912, but the criticism really picks up in more recent years, and there was, I think, an expectation when the court granted this case that it would, would overturn Dr. Miles and do so relatively by a relatively large margin. It ends up overruling Dr. Miles, but only by a 5-4 decision. But I think in some respects this is an accident of history because the Legion case is decided at the exact same time the Supreme Court is deciding important cases about the use of race in schools and the use of partial birth abortion. And in these contexts, you had a certain part of the court that thought that the majority of the court was deviating from stare decisis. And in the context of that debate, ongoing debate about stare decisis, I think it's fair to say that some justices that might have voted to overturn Dr. Miles were not that interested in explaining why Dr. Miles could go, but the Carhartt decision should stay or some of the court's race cases should stay. So I think in some respects the, the, this may be even more determined than it looks at first blush, that this is an area of the law where the Supreme Court is looking in these, at these cases and is very skeptical of the claims of the antitrust plaintiffs. Let me, let me just f close with two thoughts, one on the antitrust cases and then the more general concluding thought. In the antitrust cases, I think what's important to stress is that, as, as I indicated, these are not decisions that are being written just by the conservatives on the court and reflect some sort of, you know, bitterly divided court. Some of the most significant decisions in the antitrust and, and related contexts have been written by Justice Souter and Justice Breyer. I'd pick two cases just to mention briefly, the Bell Atlantic against Twombly case, where the court uh, significantly cut back on sort of the, the pleading standards law in the area, at least in the area of antitrust complaints, and made it much easier to dismiss an antitrust complaint uh, at the motion to dismiss stage than had previously been understood. As if to underscore my point about stare decisis, in the context of that decision, Justice Souter, without any of the parties asking the court to do it, overruled language from Connolly v. Gibson that had been on the books for 50 years and, as I said, was not even questioned by the parties. Uh, Justice Souter in that case simply said that particular phrase had puzzled the profession long enough and got rid of it. So, I mean, it's a very muscular opinion, a 7-2 decision of the court to dismiss the antitrust uh, complaint in that case and overrule a case in the process. The other case is a case called Credit Suisse against Billing where the court found that the securities laws essentially preempted the antitrust laws. 
so-called implied, uh, imp imp implied antitrust immunity. The court was looking at conduct that was alleged to violate both the securities laws and the antitrust laws, and the court essentially said, look, let the, let the securities regulators take care of this problem. We don't need to have antitrust juries with the potential for treble damages uh, be involved in this area as long as we have the regulators looking at, the, at, at this already. And I think you can actually unite the, the billing case with, an, with a case from the late Rehnquist court called the Trinco decision and the link line decision that's before the court this term. I think all of those court cases show that one thing you can say about the Roberts court is in an area of business law where there are federal regulators looking at a specific problem, they are less inclined, I think, than prior courts would have been, substantially less inclined, to say, all right, let's have uh, kind of antitrust juries involved in this as well as uh, the, the regulators. I think they sort of feel like one federal regulatory system is enough, and if the federal regulators can deal with the problem, we don't need uh, antitrust regulation through juries. So to, to wrap this up, I would simply say that I do, I stick, I stick by my guns to say that sort of talking about the Roberts court as a business court is a very much a vast oversimplification and doesn't really advance the ball. And I think going forward, I think what you can see, though, is if you start looking at more specific areas, then I think some meaningful trends do emerge. And I think those trends suggest that in, in, a, in a term like this one, where the court has a fair number of employment cases on the court's dockets, the, the business community is going to lose some significant cases. In a term like some of the first terms of the Roberts Court, where they had a lot of antitrust and patent cases on the court's docket, the corporate defendants in those cases are going to fare very well. And my, you know, my sense is that these are pretty well-established uh, trends. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little too early to say anything too definitive about the Roberts Court, but especially if you look at the margins of victory, in some of these cases, it does seem like this is, this is an aspect of the Roberts Court that is very much here to stay and worth, worth, worth thinking about when you think about the Roberts Court as a business court. So I think we have a little time for some questions. Uh, there's a microphone. If, if uh, folks could just wait until the, the microphone gets to them before asking your question. Uh, other questions? I know you said that you... We're not going to talk about arbitration, but you also said that this was a very pro-arbitration court. Um, in maybe a minute or two, could you say a little bit about the court's approach to arbitration and how it might differ from some of its predecessors? Well, I, I guess, you know, I'd use uh, – what's it? Okay, I'll repeat the question. The, the, the question is just to hum a few bars more about the arbitration. I mean, I said in passing that this is a very pro-arbitration court, and could I say a few words uh, to kind of uh, elaborate on that? And I guess I would use the, the, the Pied against a 14 Penn Plaza case as an illustration because, you know, I mean, in, in fairness, the, the late Rehnquist court was a very pro-arbitration court as well. And, you know, and, and I think one way to describe the jurisdiction of the last 10 years in the, antitrust, in the arbitration context is the tie goes to arbitration. If there's any close question about whether a matter has to go into federal, can go to federal court notwithstanding an arbitration clause somewhere in the background, if there's a dispute about whether it has to go to the arbitrators or whether you can get into federal court anyways, in virtually every case uh, the court has said that, there, that it has to be arbitrated. Now, there was a long line of cases, or a reasonably long line of cases, that dated back to the 1970s, though, that I have to say I had humbly read as suggesting that, that those rules didn't apply in the context of a collective bargaining agreement. And so, as I'd sort of understood the law, if you had a collective bargaining agreement where the union, on behalf of the employee, had agreed to arbitrate claims generally, I'd sort of understood a line of cases called Gardner Denver to say that that did not apply to federal anti-discrimination claims, that the federal anti-discrimination laws were too important to essentially have somebody else bargain your rights away. And so an individual employee, if they, even if it was a standard form contract, could, could essentially agree to arbitrate those claims, but the union could not do it for that employee. And at least in the, in the context of the, of the Pyatt case, somewhat to my surprise, the Supreme Court held five to four that in this context, the claims that were covered by the collective bargaining agreement were subject to arbitration. And so I think, you know, at the beginning of the case, when I was looking at, the, at, 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 at this particular case, I identified it as kind of the test uh, 
for just how pro-arbitration the court has become. And I think the fact that at least five justices said these claims are subject to arbitration uh, goes a long way to saying that if you have even an arguable uh, claim that an arbitration cl uh, clause covers uh, a particular dispute, you can be expecting to make your argument to the arbitrator pretty soon. I just wrote in my evaluation of this program that it was excellent, and I totally disagree with most of what you said. <laughs> uh, and that's the best kind of uh, praise one can give. Um, the patterns are all very interesting, and uh, there's sort of a difference between the patterns and, and the gut stuff. A couple of things disturb me, and I'd like you to comment on them. One, when you went talked about the savings clause, um, it seems to me a um, uh, dirty pool when a court says, well, the legislature could have said this specifically. Uh, that is usually an interpretive thing, and uh, that is, I think, better justice than taking refuge in the thing. Well, they didn't say it 100%. The other thing uh, that bothers me much more is the... No matter, what the pot, no matter what the patterns are, the Ledbetter case was horrible. The Ledbetter, I don't know of any area in the law where the modern notion that the right doesn't exist until the knowledge of the right comes into being has ever been adopted. And to find that concept to be operative in the Supreme Court in, uh, in uh, 2000, and I think it's a 2008 case, I find uh, abominable. But I do respect very much what you said about the uh, Federal Circuit Court. But isn't that, in effect, simply – it's become like an administrative law agency, an administrative agency which needs supervision by a higher power? Well, and let me try to take the, the, those in turn. Um, you know, in terms of the statutory construction that goes on in the context of uh, it, the preemption cases, you know, sometimes I, you know, I think you have to give the, the, the court a little bit of uh, sort of slack, so to speak, just because in, in some of these statutes you have, both a, you, bo you have both a preemption clause and a savings clause. And so, you know, the court is, 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 is struggling with a product of the legislative process uh, that, you know, that, you know, and whether it's, you know, whether there's a, a harmonic convergence of these two clauses that seem to point in different uh, uh, directions, which I think in some cases there are. I mean, I think in some of these statutes you can read them together and it's clear that they wanted certain types of claims preempted and certain types of claims saved. But on the other hand, you know, one has a sneaking suspicion in the context of some of these statutes that a certain coalition of Congress people, maybe in the House, got the preemption clause in there, and then a certain group of people in the Senate got a savings clause in there, and then they got to conference, and they really hoped that they'd be able to have enough votes to get rid of the other clause, and they couldn't, and they said, you know, let's, 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 yeah, let those guys across the street deal with it. So I think some of these cases are, you know, quite legitimately difficult in that respect. You know, the Ledbetter case is, 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 to me, an interesting case because I think that, um, you know, I mean, you obviously uh, are not a big fan of it, to say the least. On the other hand, I think that there was a strong argument that the Court's prior precedents in the Title, in the title VII statute of limitations area did point to that result. The, the thing I guess I would say, though, I find the most interesting about the case um, is that it is, you know, I mean, it is a case where, um, it's a somewhat of an anomaly that that case went before the Supreme Court at all because there are two, at least in the context of gender discrimination, there are two overlapping federal statutes that, pro that provide protection for somebody in the situation of Lily Ledbetter. There's Title VII and then there's something called the Equal Pay Act. And what's a bit of an anomaly is that the Equal Pay Act is very clear that it provided full recovery in these circumstances. And so if in a normal case you would have brought a claim and, you know, I mean, lawyers love to plead in the alternative. So if you would have brought your normal case where you'd have pled a violation of both the Equal Pay Act and the Title VII violation and the jury found a violation, it wouldn't have made any difference whether Title VII went back 
to the original violation or not because the Equal Pay Act did, the measure of damages was the same. And so, you know, it was, it was not an issue that was kind of destined to get to the Supreme Court. Now, for facts that are very specific to the particular case, at some point along the line, the Equal Pay Act claim dropped out of the case, got waived, um, you know, there was some, you know, I mean, I, I don't know the exact details, um, but the Equal Pay Act claim dropped out of the case. And if you go back and look at the way the, the, the Ledbetter case was litigated, it's actually kind of an interesting case study because neither side could really make their best argument. Because, you know, it's a case where on the one side, if you were arguing for the plaintiff in that case, you'd love to get up there and sort of bang the table about the incredible unfairness to this. But, of course, if the answer to the unfairness was, yeah, that's why Congress passed the Equal Pay Act and you can get your damages under that, that sort of takes some of the wind out of your sails. On the other hand, if you were arguing for the employer in that case, what I presume you'd want to argue is, geez, you know, this is an impossible burden on employers. They have to keep pay records forever. You know, I think in this particular case, you know, this was, you know, this was, you know, Goodyear that was the defendant, but it was Goodrich that was the employer at the time. So it's like you got a couple of mergers in between here and there, and the, the record-keeping mess would be just a disaster. Of course, you can't make that argument because you have to keep all those records for purposes of the Equal Pay Act. So it was a case where, you know, it, it really is something of an anomaly. And I think if you, you know, if you, if, 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 you, if you want to go back and look at the transcript of the oral argument, you can see both sides kind of arguing a little bit with one hand tied behind their back. And then the last thing about the Federal Circuit is, I mean, you know, to be sure, I mean, you know, like any time you have a, a court with the possibility of certiorari review, sooner or later the court's going to take some of these cases and it's going to look at, um, at, at what the Federal Circuit's done. I guess since I have a few friends who are judges on the Federal Circuit, I think on, on their behalf I have to take some umbrage on calling them a mere administrative agency. I don't think they'd like that at all. They're, they're, they're very proud of their Article III tenure and lifetime you know, salary protection and all that. So, uh, so I think they would take some umbrage at that. I don't know if we have time for one more question. One more quick question right, right, right here in front. Just briefly, you ducked on arbitration. Uh, is, it your, is it your opinion that the Roberts Court believes that arbitration is a way to judicial economy and, you know, lessening dockets? Well, you know, I, I, I do think it's another question. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I, think it's, I think that's an underlying aspect of this. I think the fact that... Um, and again, this is the arbitration. One of the reasons I didn't want to focus on arbitration specifically is just I think it's hard to put too much of the arbitration label, pro-arbitration label, just on the Roberts Court because the Rehnquist Court was already, you know, sort of nine steps down the road of being being very pro-arbitration. And I do think it's, you know, it's a reflection of the fact that especially when you have disputes among corporations that it's very efficient uh, for them to arbitrate. You know, I have to say, uh, just as an aside, though, in, you know, in my kind of new life as a private practitioner in talking to in-house counsel, it seems like there's almost, at the same time, the court is becoming very pro-arbitration. There's a little bit of a backlash in the corporate defendant community because I think people have recognized that, you know, I mean, sometimes appellate review is really nice, and sometimes you can have arbitration panels uh, that are taking forever to decide a case, and everybody thinks of arbitration as being very kind of speedy. But, you know, there, there is a sense in which you d if you don't have the Court of Appeals looking over your shoulder the way you do in a trial court, uh, that, you know, sometimes the arbitrators can take their time. Um, you know, they are generally getting paid by the day or the hour, and so there's a little incentive to make sure you read every pleading. So, you know, th so I think one thing would be kind of interesting to watch going forward is whether at the same time the court becomes very pro-arbitration, that trend is undercut a little bit by, by how many uh, arbitration agreements there are, at least in the corporate-to-corporate -corporate, uh, agreement. I mean, I think in light of the Pyatt case, there probably will be a fair number of arbitration clauses popping up in the, in the collective bargaining agreement context, unless, of course, Congress uh, revisits the Pyatt case. So. Well, thank you very much. We have, we, have a, we have a small parting gift which, uh, uh, for, for Paul. Uh, he's going to have to run off and catch a plane, but for the rest of you, there is a reception in the wall behind me. I hope you will all join us. Uh, and once again, please join me in thanking uh, uh, Paul for making the trip.